and we'll go with this. All right, so the first thing to notice is I've got a variety of information. If we look at it in regular form, at the very top, all of this is one set of data. So I've got picture boxes and text boxes, I've got lines, I've got custom text boxes, and I've got pictures with clipping mask. Right here, here's my table that I'm working with. So the first thing we need to do is to actually set up the table and set up the document that we're working with to place everything in. File new. In this case, we're going to make it, uh, let's see, seven inches wide, four inches tall. And we'll set my margins to be a quarter of an inch on all sides. There we go. Say okay to that. <clears throat> basic, basic setup with this one. Here's the first thing you got to know a table has to be nested inside of a text box. Everything in Illustrator has to have some sort of frame around it. In our case, we're going to make a text frame to place the table into. Let's drag these out of the way for now. With our text frame created, at the very top, tables have their own drop-down menu. So just about anything you want to do for a table or with a table can be found within here, including inserting a new one. <clears throat> now our table is going to have five rows and five columns. I've never really found a good use for the header and the footer rows in making a table. I've never used them. I just create the, the size and dimensions that I need. So I usually leave those blank. We'll say okay to that. So here's the default table that we have. Second thing to consider, since this is inside of a text box, if you want to make any adjustments to your table as far as changing the size, selecting things, it has to be done with the type tool. If you choose your regular selection tool and try to select it, all it's going to do is move your text box around. It's got to be the type tool since it's inside of a text box to make that, um, to make that type of selection. Cool? Number one thing. Second thing, when I say a selection, uh, of course you've got the individual cells in rows and columns. Think of every cell as like a text box in itself. So I can go in, I've got my cursor, and I can type in and format within that one. I can select what's inside the cell, but if I wanted to select the cell, I need to click and drag beyond that until the whole cell is selected. Same way for selecting rows or even columns. This way I've got the, quote, table selected and not just an individual content inside of it. When we start to format things and change them up, that's one thing to select. And I can quickly and easily delete everything from there. <clears throat> so now that I've got my table set up, let's start actually formatting and seeing how we can change it. I'll go into preview mode. One thing you can do, since it is kind of an object, you can select cells and you can treat them as you would any other object. They've got a fill and they've got a stroke. So the line that's around it can have a, a thickness to it. To change the fill color, once you've got it selected, simply a matter of choosing the color you want, you can even drop the tint of it and change that up as well. So now I've got a tint of blue. I chose just these two. I could change it to whatever other color that I need from that. One other thing, however, to make it a lot simpler, imagine if you had a, a huge long list, something that's got like a hundred different rows, and I wanted to quickly be able to find something. One way of doing it is to highlight the area that you want, so it kind of distinguishes from all the other. This one does a good job of showing you the highlight. And so in a table, one thing graphically you can do is to alternate the color of one row and another row, or one column and another column. If I was to select it, maybe I'd drop that down to a different tint, and then I can go to the next alternate column, choose the color, choose the tint, drop it down, and go from there. Pretty cool? That's going to be very tedious, however, if I've got a hundred different columns. So here's the next thing to keep in mind. Let's undo all that I've done. Oops. I'm going to go ahead and, well, really, if I've got one of them selected, I've got the whole table. Under Table, you can open up the Table Options. I'm just going to choose Table Setup. These Table Options will give you further ways to refine how your table looks. Adding rows, adding columns, changing the border of the entire thing. One of the options is to show how to fill it in. And you can tell it to fill in in an alternating pattern. 
In this case, you can choose it to fill in every other row, every other column. These are some of the more uh, common ones to do. We're going to do every other row to be something different. I've got preview turned on so you can see how it will automatically fill things in. So in this case, the first row, well, we're going to make it blue. Tell it to have a tint of 20%. And the next one, we're just going to keep exactly the same. Even if I added more rows to this, so there's a six, seven, eight, nine, it automatically fills in with other rows and columns that you have. If I was to get rid of them, let's go back to five. We'll say okay to that. So that's the first thing. As far as formatting a text, uh, a table that you have, you can format the fill of it and you can do that through the table options. Here's the second thing, <clears throat> changing the weight of the lines inside of your grid. Never keep your text, uh, your tables, the default setting that they have. You always want to kind of customize it to make it look a little bit better. So I'm going to select mine. The magic trick to this one is found in this box right here. Whatever is blue is the line area that's selected. And you can see the outer edge of this is blue. The inside lines are not selected, which means any changes that I create will only affect the outer edges and not the inside. So let's change it to something thicker. So there I've made it six point. You can see now the outer edges were only affected. <clears throat> if I was to click on the lines, I can deselect them. Now I've got the left and the right, and I can change those to be something different. Turn those off to zero. Now you can see the left and the right side to this one is selected. The main thing is, when I have it se this selected, be sure you've got the correct line structure up here selected first before you make the changes to your structure. So on this one, we're going to select them all. Uh, let's see, all the lines are selected, so make sure, just click on each one, and we're going to set them all to be half a point. Now they're all nice and thin. Still got everything selected. The next one, I just want the left side and the right side to have no lines. So we need to deselect everything else. There we go. Set that to zero. So now I've lost the edges on both of them. The top one, what size does the top line need to be? Three point, thank you. And the bottom one, what does that one need to be? One point. One point. Very good. Making sure you all paying attention. <clears throat> the main thing is, now you can see I've got this, I still got my um, table created and I've changed up the size and the dimensions of this. You only get those options whenever you select at least one cell or multiple cells up here. Notice the text options will change. All right, next page, page two. Let's actually add some data to what we're working with. I am giving you the game day text, so this is the Word file that goes on with it. <clears throat> and there's two bits to it. You've got the, um, the name of the columnist and the newspaper that they work for. This needs to be in this first column. And then you've got their predictions going in each of the other columns. So let's type in, I'm just going to do the first one for the class. First guy was Mike Sherman. Hit return. He works for the Oklahoma. His prediction, Yankees, 11 to 7. I can hit tab, go over to the next one, Rockies, 2 to 3, Tigers, 8 to 9, and Mets, 4 to 6. Notice that I've just typed everything in raw. Didn't do any formatting just yet, but I will need to have the same formatting for everything that's on here. In this case, the name style needs to be myriad. I think we're going to do bold condensed. Newspaper he's working for is Minion Italic. Drop that down to 11. And as far as the remaining ones, this one's going to be myriad bold condensed. <coughs> All caps. Dupe. Score will be myriad. Oops. Regular. Drop that down to 11. Cool. Hey, if I needed to reformat every other one, what's one way I can quickly format things? 
Paragraph styles, set you a paragraph style, specifically for this one. So there's one paragraph style. Make a new one, we'll call this team. And we'll set this one, we'll call this score. So now all I have to do is select it. Oops. And choose the right formatting for that one. Select the score, reformat each of the scores. Easy, easy stuff. <clears throat> The second thing to consider is to um, format the cells that are inside of it. <clears throat> if I do highlight a cell, for instance these, not only do I have the way the cells look, but I can also format the way the text interacts with it. I can make the text centered in this case. If I needed to change the width of it, I can always hover my mouse in between it, change the height of those. Or, as you saw, if I hit return, it's automatically going to adjust the height based on that. There are other ways of readjusting it to be a, a specific size. To do that, we'll need to open up my tables palette. If you don't see it, there's type and tables. There's my table palette. This will give us full control over the look and feel of each individual cell and how my table looks. Hey, just as we have paragraph and uh, character styles, You've also got table styles and cell styles that you can quickly save and uh, apply to a format from here. What we're going to do is, let's see, we're going to select each one of these. Uh, let's see, oh, sorry, let's do the first column first. We're going to move this one over. So all of the names need to be shifted over to add room so where you can add a picture to it. We're going to shift them over for half of an inch. Select the cells that you want. <clears throat> in our tables palette, down here at the bottom, this is the amount of inset, the amount of space between the two. Here's our left side inset. If I was to type in 0.5 in, you can see it pushed it over from there. I will need to change the size of this one. Notice when I pull that over, <clears throat> excuse me, it pushes everything else on this side. So I'll need to contract these in order to make it fit. So if I wanted to, I could select all of those. I could contract each one individually, or in case of the um, instructions, I can tell it exactly what size I want it to be. Either to be at least a certain size or exactly one size, but I want the width of it, this one right here, to be uh, one inch, one in. This will automatically reformat those to be exactly one inch at least from there. Even though it's set up, I can still click on the individual ones and resize everything to get it to be formatted, to fit. <clears throat> Give you fair warning, to make everything uh, fit well in your final design, this first column does need to be really wide, and this last column is going to be a little bit wider than your other columns. This is so you can have enough room to fit all of your text uh, once it's back on there. All cool as far as formatting the cells. You have your tables palette open. This gives you the full control over the size, the number of cells that you have, everything else from there. Okay, I'm only going to do that top one. You're going to repeat the same process for all of the data once it's set up. Now let's add the rest of the information for my table. Since it is in a text frame, I can resize it, move it down. <clears throat> the text information up here you can see is rotated at 45 degrees and it's in a special little text box. Here I, here's how I created that one. First of all, drew off a line at a 45 degree to match that up. Got my line tool. What width of my line should it be? 0.5, good. I want to match that same width. If you hold down the shift key, that'll give you a perfect angle. And I'm just going to hold down option now and make a copy of them. Nudge that over. There's that right there. I can go back later and adjust the size of it. Let's add the text information. Make a box. In my case, the first game is... Blue Jays at Yankees, 7.30, Friday. You can select it, change the format of it, uh, just make it bold for now. 
Since it is at a 45 degree, all I've got to do is rotate it. There's 45 degree angle. And then I can readjust the size of it and the formatting of it to make sure it fits inside of there. However, check out what I've got. <clears throat> Since I've rotated it 45, it's still lining up along this edge of my text box. If you see my original, I've got it lining up along the bottom edge of this area. To create that effect, all I did was change the shape of my text box. And to do that, I just used my direct selection tool. Remember with the white arrow, I can click individual points, click only on one, and then I can change up the shape of that one, pull this in right there, and now it's lining up nice and flush on that particular side. Just be sure if it's too far in, it'll do something wonky like that. If it's far enough over, it'll stay nice and aligned. Hey, since I've got one already created, all it is is a matter of copying that one, changing out my information, reformatting what I need. <clears throat> Maybe I'd make the size of that font a little bit smaller. Did I lose everybody? Easy, easy stuff. Nothing you haven't done before. The rest of it is simply adding the um, game day calls, giving you the Major League Baseball logo, add that to your design. Feel free to change the colors of it. I use the stock blue that came with uh, just the default document. If you want to create your own blue, I think I made one that's a little bit more muted to, to match the logo. You're welcome to do that as well. Final thing we need to do is to format the pictures and place those inside of here. I think I've already got Mike Sherman's done. So we'll drop Mike in. <clears throat> Scale him up to fit. There he is. Looking dapper. Under the clipping path, I've gone ahead and made a Photoshop clipping path for his picture. So there it is for there. But I will review how we need these to be opened up because I do want to show you something regarding these pictures. I'm going to drag them into Photoshop. All of the pictures I'm giving you are going to be in RGB format. So we need to change this into CMYK. <coughs> as soon as Photoshop decides to open. There we go. The other thing to notice is they're all going to be different sizes. This is kind of a common problem you'll, you'll face when working in a publication. What's a good size photograph? Uh, the, the size of the head should be a dime. That's good. Uh, as far as the... Um, Resolution. What's a good resolution? Let's put it that way. 300 dpi. 300, that's always what you go for. If you're having to print a large photograph that's got good resolution, good uh, printability, 300 is good. However, check out Mike Sherman's image size. His is quite, quite small. The overall size of it is a little over 1.5 by 2.5. However, think about the context of which it's being used. We're not blowing this picture up nice and big. It's going to be used very small to begin with. So in this case, you can get away with smaller resolution images as long as you can make out exactly what it looks like. If it looks good at the size of a dime, then it should be okay to, in general to print. However, if, if ever possible, just demand the high, highest resolution that you can get away with. In this case, we're going to keep everything the same. Uh, let's do John Bernowski. Change his mode to grayscale. Discard that. We'll grab our pen tool. And remember, with the pen, we've got it set to path. And I'm just going to quickly draw off around his head. Saved there. In my paths palette, Got a working path, double click it, got to rename it something. Now that it saved his head, we can keep it a JPEG. Just save it. I will bump up the JPEG options. Let's place John in there. There's John. Scale him down. turn on his Photoshop clipping path. There's his head. There it is, cropped out. Wherever it needs to go, of course, I'll need to scale it down to be appropriate. I think he's a little bit too dark. I would lighten that up just a little bit with that one. 
once you are finished. So this is kind of how it should look. Everything should be fitting nicely between the um, between the margins. Of course, I've moved everything out of the way now. Come on. There we go. Feel free to play around with the colors. Feel free to make your own general type of placement and change it up. You'll save this as a PDF, and then you'll upload the PDF to Moodle once you're finished with that. If you are finished early, feel free to start work on your project. Any questions? I know I flew through that one. All right, I'll turn your computer on.